to um, start uh, my screen sharing so that I can show you how to access the resources that are already available to you. And in terms of my preparation for uh, this talk uh, this afternoon in Malaysia, I've actually put this on the web so you'll be able to access it and go through all the URLs with all of the resources that I've prepared for you. So, as I say, this will be all uh, laid out and I'll refer to things like the living posters, the idea of an action planner to focus on your own practice. I'll go through where you can actually publish, uh, as Sarah was saying about uh, living educational theories. Um, I'll go through the doctorates and the masters that are all on the web that you can have a look at. And also I'll try to look at the kind of communities around the world that people and scholars and students at the University of Malaysia can also relate to and join in with, especially the network of educational action researchers in Ireland that is particularly well developed. And I know Sarama and Seth and others at the University of Malaysia have already made connections with those communities and have actually contributed to them. But I'm going to encourage you to actually link into them. And the only other thing that I would like to point out just before I go into the screen sharing is in the chat facility, it's rather important that as I'm going along, if you have any questions or responses, that you put them in the chat. Because this will enable me to understand the kind of questions that might be useful to you for me to answer. And this is really important in both action research and living theory, that dialogue, and that's educational conversation, <coughs> is one of the main ways in which we improve our practice. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to start the screen sharing. Now, could I just check that you can actually see my web pies? Could Saramat, could you just nod if you can see it? Yeah, thank you. Now, what I want you to just make sure is that you can all access the actionresearch.net, that this is the website with all the resources on. And I'll be taking you through this because here is my presentation today, which I'll go into. You'll see that there's a current issue of eJolts with all the past uh, issues. It's free to publish. You can access it with all the details of how to do it. I'll be going into my living theory posters and into symposia for AERA and other conferences to try to encourage you to work together to actually develop proposals for national and international conferences to highlight the work you are doing at the University of Malaysia. So what I've done here is to go into <coughs> the presentation and all with all the resources that I produce. And here is the flyer for the meeting that was actually produced by the organizers with all the details that <coughs> what we're going to be actually focusing on today to improve your practice through action research and living educational theory research. Now, what I did, and this was about 1973, that I became dissatisfied with the way in which universities were talking about educational theory. I was a head of a science department in a secondary school and I studied for four years part time for the philosophy, psychology, sociology of education, and I got my master's degree in the psychology of education. Um, I started out in education with a degree in physical science, so the joint honors in physics and chemistry. When I actually had done about four or five years of teaching, it's really hit me very hard that the academics in the university who were telling me that educational theory was made up of the philosophy, psychology, sociology, and history of education had actually got it wrong. They made a very big mistake that that did not constitute educational theory in the sense that an educational theory should be able to produce a valid explanation of my educational influence in my own learning and the learning of others and the learning of the social formation that influenced my practice and understanding. Now, I want this to be very clear because 
I've been advocating for many years now the perspective of living educational theory, and that is that each one of us present today has got the capacity to produce a valid explanation of your educational influence in your own learning and the learning of others, and those are your students or colleagues, as well as the learning of the organization and the culture within which you're working. Now that means that you actually sometimes have got to question the academics who still believe that their discipline of education, like philosophy, psychology, sociology, history, management, economics, politics, is actually constituting educational theory. Now, it can contribute to it, but it can contribute, you can use insights from those theories in building your own living educational theory. And I do hope I'm clear about that point. And the other point that I want to focus on is to do with the values that, for example, your vice chancellor highlights where it says the university and teaching and learning center at your university, it actually includes these values of being truthful, trustworthy, fair, responsible, transparent, efficient, wise, excellent, mutual respect with acceptance, communication, gratitude, continuous learning, integrity, self-reflection, vision, and spirit. Now, those are all on your website as values that your, uh, if you like, the leader at the University of Malay is actually saying, look, these are shared values. Now, what I want to emphasize is that it is rather different coming out with a list of values like that in that paragraph here and the meanings of the values that you express in your practice. It is one thing to be able to talk and use value words like integrity, respect, freedom, justice, democracy. It is one thing to be able to talk as I am doing now and using those value words. It is another to live your values in your practice and your relationship. And the point about action research and living educational theory research is that the meanings of your values, the ones you express in your practice, are clarified in the course of their emergence in your practice. So I hope I'm being making sense here that the way you embody and express the values that you use to give meaning and purpose to your life is based on a unique constellation of values that actually help to constitute who you are. And those can't just be put in a list of values words. You will need to research your own practice, often with digital visual data, because it's often through showing yourselves in your practice that you clarify and communicate the meanings of your values. And I always and often use digital visual data that in, is included, and you'll see that in my own papers, to communicate my meanings. And at the heart of an expression of these values is something that I think you will recognize. It's called a life affirming energy that all of you in terms of what you do will be expressing an energy. You can't do anything without energy. And yet we very rarely show this life affirming energy in our research papers. And it's so important this for you to recognize through the visual data that you are expressing this life affirming energy connected to your values in what it is you're doing in developing your scholarship of teaching and learning. So this is my assumption now, right at the beginning of my talk. And as I say, I do hope you will put in the chat any questions that you want me to actually <coughs> return to and actually answer. But what I'm going to do is focus on this assumption, which is at the heart of the presentation, that each one of us has an educational responsibility to research the question, how do I improve what I'm doing in my professional practice? This is a very important point about your educational responsibility 
as you research and work in higher education, you're supported by a higher education institution like the University of Malaysia to actually research your own question, how do I improve my practice? And that refers to your educational influence in teaching and learning. And I want you to be very clear that there is a big difference between learning and what is educational, that you can learn many things that are not educational. History is full of examples of where whole cultures have actually developed ideas and learning in their citizens, which have led to war, it's led to dehumanization. So that is why I always stress these values of human flourishing, that it's not sufficient just to focus on learning. You've really got to justify the educational influences in learning that you are having in your own learning and the learning of other people, as well as the culture and the organization within which you're living and working. So that is why I'm really asking you all to put in your own educational responsibility with your own unique constellation of values that you use to justify what it is you're doing as you work to improve your, your learning. And that is what I coined the phrase about in the 1980s, that your explanation of your educational influence was actually your own living educational theory. This was your explanation of your educational influence in your own learning and the learning of others. <clears throat> Excuse me, and that distinguishes it from the old disciplines approach about making educational theory made up of philosophy, psychology, sociology, history. The discipline that often actually you will have studied yourselves, you would have got, I would have thought, a degree or a, a contribution expertise in a particular discipline. Now, your educational influence and in explaining that requires you to be an educational researcher exercising your educational responsibility. Now, the very first thing I, I want to point to and encourage you to do is to form <coughs> your own, what we call living posters. And I will be going through these six points here with all the resources that you can actually access to try to help you to explain how you could create and share your own living poster on your research. And this is something, a living poster is your initial attempt to share with others, both the context and your actual understanding of your values and what it is you're doing. And from that, you can actually start to use an action reflection planner to actually share this with others as you get your living theory search underway. And that you can actually then participate in other communities. And I know Seth and Sarima and others are already making connections with these networks around the world, like Network Education Action Research Island, NERI, and they've actually created values-based practitioner researchers SIG in the Educational Studies Association of Ireland. And I want to get you into their poster plus their report on their recent, what they call NERI Meet, which is a really superb analysis of, there were some over 50 participants in that um, meeting uh, last week to actually show how the practitioner researchers around the world are getting together to share their own practitioner research. I'm also going to encourage you to contribute to both self-study and action research SIGs in the American Education Research Association and other organizations within Malaysia and within the Eastern, the Asian uh, organizations that are supporting practitioner research. And then I want to show you how you can go into the Educational Journal of Living Theories and actually contribute your own in terms of that journal. Before I point to all of the living educational theory doctors and masters from around the world that you can actually access to demonstrate the academic legitimacy of the approach that I'm actually promoting. So first of all, I just want to show you, <coughs> excuse me, how to access this idea of your living posters. Now, you can click on the home page and you will be able to this at the moment, I'll just add a, enlarge just some of the um, networks around the world who are already submitting their living posters and sharing them. And if you go into this and just click here, it will explain how you can create and share your living poster and actually submit it 
for example, to me, and then I can add it to this one here. They've got the Malaysian research group. You can see here the Indian one, the Educational Journal of Living Theories, the Irish one, University of Cumbria, this Blue Water in Canada. You've got them all here in terms of the different research groups, the Mongolian National University of Education group, but the one I just want to point you to and ask you to really start to contribute your own living poster is the Malaysian Education Action Research Group, where you've got both Seth, you've got Zelia, you've got Sarima, and you've got Satita, and they've already uh, contributed their living posters. Now, these are really important to get you going. But you can see at the moment, given the uh, at the moment, you'll have over 100 people here today, and each one of you could actually create and share your own living poster. And that enables people not only in Malaysia and the University of Malaysia, but people all over the world to actually access your own details about your context and what it is that you're doing. And if you look, for example, at Sarima's living poster, and just look at I as a living contradiction that Sarima gave a talk and focused on this experience. If you ask the question, how do I improve my practice? Then often the I within your question recognizes that you're not yet living your values as fully as possible. And this creates a tension in you, which I referred to as a living contradiction. And Sarima has actually outlined the kind of feeling that she had when this idea of uh, negating some of your values and it from stimulates your imagination to think what you need to do to then improve your practice. But what I want you to do is to, I want to encourage you to make sure that you go into the Malaysian Action Research Group from the homepage of all of the living posters here and send in your living poster which actually can then be added to this because at the moment there are four of you in the Malaysian research group. Now, when you look at some of the other um, groups, you'll see just how many people have submitted their living posters from different parts of the world and sharing what it is they're doing in a global social movement of people that are interested in the scholarship of teaching and learning, but who are interested in communicating with each other and developing their own living posters. Now, what I want to make sure that each one of you can do is, <coughs> excuse me, to actually access something which everybody who has done a living educational theory, looked at the scholarship of teaching and learning, has found very helpful just to get their um, research underway with the question, how do I improve what I'm doing? And if you go into what is called the Action Research Planner, which is for people who want to develop their own living educational theory, it begins with how do I improve what I'm doing? You can download this and just use it. And you'll see that at the top there is a site of practice. And this allows you to say something about the practice, not only the practice you're involved in, but the site. Because if you're all working in Malaysia and you're associated with the University of Malaysia, you will all be influenced by particular contextual issues, whether it's historical and sociocultural, which actually influence your practice. And this point here about the site of practice enables you to actually say something about the cultural influences, the historical influences from within your own unique context which are influencing your practice. Now, the center of the inquiry process and reflection, it goes back to John Dewey, and as well as going in the 1940s with action research, you've got these kind of questions. What's your concern? What do you want to improve? What are the reasons for you concern? In the sense that you are not living your values as fully as possible, how can you actually talk about the reasons for your concern? What might you do to improve your practice? You start to actually create your own action plan. And you share this with others 
to focus on something which is manageable from within your context. And you say what it is you want to do to improve your practice. Now, one of the crucial things here as researchers is that you want to be able to know your influence in your practice. And this is why you need to gather data which you can use to build up an evidence-based explanation of your influence. Your data can be from your students, it can be from yourself, it can be journals, it can be videos, questionnaires, it can actually be anything that helps you to try to understand the educational influence that you're having in your own learning and the learning of others. So this is why you ask, what kind of data will you need to collect to enable you to make a judgment on the outcomes of your practice in terms of the quality of your own or teachers and our pupils learning? And again, this is a vital question that you should be asking colleagues to ask of yourselves of the evidence that you've got about any claim that you make to be influencing the learning of others. So you're having an educational influence in your own learning and the learning of others. And your colleagues should be helping you to build an evidence base, a valid evidence based explanation of your educational influence in your own learning and the learning of others. You need to actually think about the kind of resources you will need to enable you to implement your plan. Now, often, uh, for example, in different parts of the world, the teacher researchers get different kinds of support. Sometimes they get no support. Other times the government actually pay uh, fees for registering for masters to enable academics to actually research their own practice. And at the heart of this process is that you work with colleagues, sometimes three to eight individuals in a validation group. And this is really important so that you don't just be accused of writing anecdote or subjective accounts that your explanations are rigorous, they are valid, and you have a validation group to help you strengthen the rigor and validity of the explanation you offer. And in a validation group, you would ask your colleagues and peers how you can improve the comprehensibility of your explanation. How could you strengthen the data you gather and the evidence you use to justify the claims you make about explanations of educational influences in learning? And again, you've all been influenced by different socio-historical and socio-cultural influences. So again, in your explanations, you need to extend and deepen your understanding of those socio-historical, socio-cultural influences. And the last question in a validation group, and these questions were derived from a sociologist called Jürgen Habermas, who did a lot of work on critical theory. And he talked about enhancing the authenticity of your explanation. And again, it's in the sense of showing that you're living your values as fully as possible. So I hope that you will access the uh, reflection planner as you get your living educational theory research underway in terms of your own scholarship of teaching and learning. Now, could I just ask, because at the moment, um, the chat facility, um, there's nobody yet who's actually put a question or an issue that you would like me to tackle in the chat facility. Now, I do want to encourage you, any questions or issues that you want to raise, I do hope you will put them in the chat because it's very helpful that I can, and you can as well, save the chat at the end of the session and go back to it. And anybody that has actually put their uh, email address in there, anybody that has got the question, or you want me to follow up something with you, it enables me then to actually respond to you in, if I haven't managed to do it here, so that you can see that I'm taking seriously the questions that you've got. So that please, in the chat, you just see, I use this a lot around with meetings around the world and I find a very, very helpful facility. Now, what I've done now is, if you like, just added here this one about participating in other communities. And what I, I want to just make sure that you've got this um, ability, and I know Seth, and I know others from the Malaysian Action Research Group, and I'm not sure if Sarama, but I thought Sarama was also at the Neary meet. 
a, a very good active group, fantastic, uh, from Ireland, led by uh, four women who got their living theory doctorates from the University of Limerick in Ireland in 9, 2006 and 7. And I do hope you'll remember their names as uh, Maureen Glenn, Mary Roach, Catriona MacDonald, Bernie Sullivan. Now, they've all got their living theory doctorates for studying their own professional practice. And you can access that uh, from my website. I'll show you how you can access all these things in a few minutes. But if you'll go into uh, both the posters um, of what is called NERI, the Network of Educational Action Research. Um, this is, again, a really fantastic resource. There are the conveners, and I do hope you will make contact with this group because, as they say, they offer a safe space for practitioner researchers to share and discuss your research and resources, uh, to discuss in a reflective environment online and face to face. And you can join NERI by sending an email there. You can actually get on to the uh, SIG that they have begun, which is the network. Educational Action Research Ireland, but this is the equivalent of your National Educational Research Association, the Educational Studies Association of Ireland, um, with this special interest group on values-based practitioner action research. And what they've done from their NERI group of last week, I do hope you'll get into this because they've done a wonderful, Maureen Glenn has edited all of the details of this Miri group, and you've got all the details here. I'll just go to the end because I want to encourage you not only to go through this um, document here, but to go, they've got the plans, January 2021, values-based practitioner research, all the different people that are actually doing this work. But you've got interim reports here, and I'll show you at the moment how to access the details of what they're now doing and <coughs> to actually spread. Uh, it is a scholarship of teaching and learning in different places around the world. And I'll show you how you can access their blog that you can make a contribution to when you've actually just gone through their report on last week's Neary Meet and you can make your own contribution and talk a little bit about the research going on at the University of Malaysia. And this is something which is so important about belonging to other par uh, um, participating in other communities of educational practitioners. Okay, now, one of the things that <coughs> quite a, a number of you are already doing is you are actually sharing your ideas in both your national and also international educational research forums. And this is what I want to encourage you to do. I was in um, South Africa doing a workshop at the University <coughs> of Technology at Durban. And it was at the time when the American Education Research Association had put out their call for paper and the deadline for submission was in a week's time from when I was running my workshop. And in my workshop, I had academics from a different, like at the University of Malaysia. There were several from the University of KwaZulu-Natal. And they'd all come, as you have, to look at the scholarship of teaching and learning and to learn about action research, living educational theory. Now, what I said to four of them who were academics, I said to them, look, why don't you come out of my workshop for the morning and work together on a symposium proposal for AERA? And they did that, they were accepted, they had me uh, as the discussant in America, and they highlighted the work and the research that they were doing in the South African universities by going uh, to the American Education Research Association and submitting their symposium. Now, this is what you could all do. What I actually um, want to encourage you to do is to go into my, uh, web page, and I just want to show you uh, on the right here, that's where you can get into the um, session for today, but you've also got, and I'll come back to the current issue of eJOLTS, 
But I want to point to this, that you can access both the symposium that has been accepted for the American Educational Research Association of April 2022, and this was on cultivating equitable education systems for the 21st century in global context through living educational theory, cultures of educational inquiry. Now you can access this successful submission. It's not often you get a whole symposium accepted at the American Educational Research Association. They're quite difficult to get on the program. We have been very fortunate that on 2021, we had our first symposium accepted for the self-study group. And this year we've got accepted for the action research self, uh, the special interest group. Now you'll just see Jacqueline Delong, Canada, uh, Jack from the UK, uh, Parbati, you've got with Nepal, Michelle from Florida, USA, Swarup Raval, India. Now these are all inquiries that you yourselves can actually undertake and put into a symposium contribution uh, for a national or international educational research association. So you can bring together, you can actually um, highlight the research that you're now doing with the Malaysian Action Research Network as you focus on the scholarship of teaching and learning and highlight literally for the world the educational influences that you are having with your unique constellation of values as you actually seek to improve your professional practice and you actually are living your educational responsibility for researching your practice. There's Jacqueline DeLongs, and you can go into this by clicking on that, and you can go in all the drafts. We, we're actually put all the drafts there. We've got to present in April. We're working together once a week to actually generate and improve our drafts. So you can go through those and you can access, there's the successful proposal from Jacqueline, then you've got mine. This is cultivating ed, uh, equitable educational systems in a UK global context and you can access the draft. But this one follows the successful symposium proposal. This is uh, to ARA in 2021. So you have, uh, just by going down the um, What's New section here, you can actually access the symposium presentation that was successful for the April 2021 conference. And the key idea here, which I believe will be relevant to every one of you, is accepting this educational responsibility. So it's unusual for academics to actually research their own question, how do I improve my practice? But it's so vital that we all accept that responsibility for researching our educational influence in our own learning and also the learning of others. And so you can actually put together a symposium presentation and you'll see this was from 2021, there's Jacqueline DeLong, there's myself, there's Papati Danganan here, there's actually Shivani who was actually head of, at uh, <coughs> one of the Sardar Patel University in India, Michelle Vaughan, University of Florida. Now, all of the contributions are in this uh, document you can access, plus this whole of the successful symposium proposal. And you can access those from the What's New section of actionresearch.net. Now, I'm just very conscious as well that I'm asking everybody if you would just put anything that is actually of interest to you in what I'm saying within the chat. Now, I've got Again, I'll just quickly go. So uh, I'll go through this. So it says, um, it's interesting, um, again, this is from Fazia. This is how apt you said, shared values and personal values that make up the individual influence professional practice may or may not be similar. Uh, would this matter? Um, again, how important are the cultural differences that may influence the research method data collection? So how a university could assist lecturers in doing action research due to their workloads and lack of knowledge and methodology. Are there any specific method to identify interest and skills 
of lecturers to be linked with their action research. Now, the, these questions are really important. Um, now, we've all got a unique constellation of values, and you'll find within your Malaysian culture that the cultural influences will be quite different to the cultural influence. For example, Swarup Rawal in India is very influenced by Hindu culture. Um, the people in the UK that I'm with, many of them are humanists and they're influenced by humanistic culture. Others within North America, like in the Canadian context, they've got their own particular interest and cultural influences. So it's acknowledging the culture in which you're in, uh, existing. One of my most recent doctoral uh, submissions successful was Ariana Briganda. I'll show you how you can access Ariana's uh, PhD. It was about a living theory of international development. Now this was carried out in Afghanistan. Now you can imagine from last August when the Taliban retook control of Afghanistan and they closed down quite a lot of the educational institutions for the education of girls. Now this is having enormous implications, uh, which are the cultural influences in terms of that context, which has got to be acknowledged. These are real and they influence the lives of so many people. So that your individual um, <coughs> professional practices are influences influenced by your context and this relationship for your, your unique individual values and the cultural values. But I believe that we all share a concern to do our best for our own students in terms of this sense of educational responsibility. We all have got values that actually we believe count towards human flourishing. And no matter where we are in the world, we can share these. Sometimes we differ, but we can engage in dialogue. That's a really important point to really work peacefully, collaboratively with these values. So it really does matter, these cultural differences, and they do influence our research methods and our data collection. So because the values, as I say, they help to work out what counts as improvement. Now, the universities can assess and assist us in doing the action research and living theory at the University of Cumbria, where I've just had my uh, contract extended for another three years. And I'm looking forward to developing with a Cumbria research group, a living educational theory research group, that the university is actually supportive of. Now, it does this in a number of ways. It offers, there's the head of academic staff development who actually provides certificates for new lecturers that are coming in who are willing to inquire into their own practice. So your university in the scholarship of teaching and learning is I already believe providing some small grants to enable you to carry out this work. So this is how you can actually gain support from within your university. But the main one would be you forming through the Malaysian Action Research Network and sharing together what it is you're doing together. Now, it says the next one is uh, from Raziza, the concept of practice. Can you elaborate further on the definition? Is the meaning stable or is it dependent on the individual? Now, this is such a good question. Now, each one of you, and asking your question, and this is so important, how do I improve my practice? Now, each one of you has got your own unique constellation of values. Each one of you in asking that question, how do I improve my practice? Your practice is influenced by the context and the values that you're bringing into what it is you are doing. So each one of you will have your, your unique Again, constellation of values and context that is helping you to state very clearly what is your practice. You know, mine at the moment is trying to enhance the influence of living educational theory research in a systemic way in these different international uh, groups that I actually talk in and I do a lot of work with. Now, the, my practice, that is my practice. When I started in 1967, it was actually focused on my science classroom. How do I improve my practice? It was very focused on my children in learning science. It then moved when I moved to the University of Bath into my continuing professional development programs. 
And from 2000 onwards, it's moved into the systemic influence as the international influence has grown. So each one of you will have your own practice, but you need to share it. You need to say clearly to other people, what is your practice that you're trying to improve? And how are you gathering data to make a judgment about whether you're having this educational influence in your own learning? So it says, is the meaning stable or is it dependent on the individual? Now, again, please remember that the meanings of your question. Mine started in 1967, first lesson I taught. How do I improve my practice? It appears my question is still the same. That's why this point in the chat is so important. But the meaning of my question has changed dramatically. It has been transformed over my 50 odd years of engagement. I hope I'm making sense here that the question, how do I improve my practice, appears to be the same, but it's so different to when I was a science teacher beginning out and to when I am now as a visiting professor of education and engaging in these kind of conversations with international research communities around the world. Now, again, we've got this superb question. Can the individual practice contradict with institutional practice? And again, it's such a crucial question, this, um, that I had great difficulty when I first started at the University of Bath 1973. Um, some a uh, couple of professors tried to get my um, tried to get me sacked. They tried to get me out of a job, and my uh, individual values were conflicting with what they wanted me to do. Now I was very lucky that a professor of public law protected my job, and I got tenure until two thousand and nine. So when I was attacked in nineteen seventy five, it wasn't successful. The, my institutional, you know, the institutional values of these professors conflicted with my own individual values. Um, I was very fortunate uh, in retaining my job. So you can sometimes get into conflict. You've got to be very careful about prudence because you do want to survive. You don't want to get kicked out of your job. So you've got to be prudent in recognizing that the institution have got responsibilities they actually put on you. But again, you've also got to keep your integrity in seeking to live as fully as you can the meaning of the values that you hold. And this is why your groups and your community within the university can help you to protect the integrity of your educational values, whilst recognizing that the university has its own legitimate responsibilities that it wants you to carry out. But like in Afghanistan at the moment, there are real serious conflicts here between, for example, equity in relation to women's rights, to an education and to access to the economy, and what it is that this new government are actually doing. So you've got to recognize that the uh, issue of educational values can be essentially contested. And you've got to be prepared for that and actually to work together to keep that integrity of your own values. And you can share these values of humanity with different groups around the world. That's right. The world moves much faster than the institution. <laughs> yes. So you've got, this is why I do encourage you to think globally to actually see the University of Malaysia could actually make this contribution by you getting involved in these different communities and putting in your living posters, putting in your living educational theories to what it is that you're actually doing to improve your practice, but also to live your values out within your own context within uh, Malaysia. Now, what I, I want to do, and many, many thanks indeed for actually posting these questions in the chat. These are really crucial questions. Now, what I, I'm going to go now, I'm just going to go back to what I uh, have covered and what I've done with this particular thing from my website, you'll see. I go in detail in terms of what I've just been covering with you. And these are all within that paper that I've got presented uh, <coughs> on my website. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have, just have a look at what you need to do just to publish your paper, uh, for example, in the journals like the Living Educational Theory Research Journal. Now, what I very much want to do is to make sure that you can actually access um, the Educational Journal of Living Theories. That was right at the top of my What's New section of my website. Now, we've been publishing this from 2008. It is freely available. 
this is the latest issue that is volume 14 issue 2 and you'll see that if you just go into this at the beginning there is just an introduction to each issue and this one here recognizes that we're in the middle of a pandemic but there have been certain advantages in being able to communicate using this technology that I've never used uh, Teams meeting, Zoom, Skype, as much as I have over the last two years. And it has enabled me to have, give this kind of talk. Imagine that from my study, you know, at home in Bath, where it's so fortunate that I've been asked again to address researchers in the University of Malaysia are associated with it. I love the scholarship of teaching and learning, and I highlight the importance of educational influence in your research and your practice. Now, this technology is something that we can all benefit from and learn to use more effectively in our global communications. And the pandemic, paradoxically, has made us use this technology much more than we were when we were going face to face. So we've also got to save the recordings, we can go back to them. You can access all of this resource now. It's on my website. It's all there, but you can access at your leisure. <clears throat> and I just want to point to the Educational Journal of Living Theories, because this is where you can publish your own uh, accounts of your educational influences in your professional practice. And you can help each other to communicate the quality and the rigor of the research going on at the University of Malaysia. This, uh, for example, I did the editorial board. Different people do the editorial foreword for each issue. This is just the recent issue about transformative teacher education that is in the Bahamas. And again, developing a transformative, cooperative living educational theory with children and youth in Bangladesh. And again, this one here is fascinating about in Nepal, working on failures and vulnerabilities improving my practice, leading an educational initiative concerned with emotional intelligence in Nepal. So I do hope you will get into some of these back issues. Have a look at this, uh, the recent one, this one. And it says, to help to grow the archive for others to take inspiration from, for the benefit of us all, whenever and wherever we live. And I just want to point on each issue, sometimes we have book reviews. And I'd like to point to this one I did on Nicholas Maxwell's The World in Crisis and what to do about it, a revolution for thought and action. And Maxwell is saying that you and I could actually benefit from what he calls the difference between knowledge inquiry and wisdom inquiry. And he says that as academics or doing PhDs or working at universities, we're all heavily influenced by knowledge inquiry. And he says that's been very, very successful for things like the vaccine production going into space. But he hasn't been very successful in solving the real life problems of living peacefully in civilized societies around the world. And for this, he says, we need to develop our wisdom inquiry. And that's why those questions, how do I improve my practice? And again, with values of human flourishing are the key questions that I'm saying in your scholarship and uh, <coughs> teaching and learning, you could actually develop your own wisdom inquiry for solving and showing how you're living those values to solve those problems. So there we have the Educational Journal of Living Theories. You can get the whole access of all the archives from 2008 just by clicking that with all the archive of public, um, all the archive of collection, collected um, issues. And I just want to point to this in the very first issue. If you click on that, this pupils as action researchers, improving something important in our lives. I want to point to this because there are some contributions that the pupils' voices, the students' voices are brought into the accounts to actually justify a claim to be influencing the learning of students and pupils. And this is where pupils, 10 year old pupils, were actually shown to be engaging in action research in their own learning with their colleagues in classrooms. 
that are videotaped showing the children are quite capable of carrying out action research on their own learning and the data being used to justify a teacher's claim they're influencing their students' learning. So that's in the very first issue in 2008. So I, I do hope you'll access some of those because they will, I think, help you with ideas about what you can do to actually both gather data on improving your practice and publishing the results of your inquiry. Now, I'll just pop back into the chat just to see if I've got, if I've got anything else. Um, yes, I've got uh, action research cycle, normally the process of planning, acting, observing, reflection. Right, if we fail to complete the cycle, can we still claim that we have improved the practice through action research. Now, the, the point about the, the cycle, um, it, I found that very valuable indeed. And I, as I say, take me back to the work of John Dewey about, okay, you, you talk about your concern, what is it you want to improve? You tell people what you want to improve. You develop an action plan. And I've given you an action research planner. You gather data to try to make a judgment about whether you have influenced your practice. You act and as you're gathering the data and then you evaluate. Now, each one of those is a recognizable phase of the action research. Now, it, it would be difficult to claim that you are improving your practice through action research without going through each of those steps. That the action reflection cycle does include those steps. <laughs> now, one of the additions which I brought into my own research, educational research, was to go beyond the action reflection cycle in that set where you actually explain and share your educational influence in learning. In action research, there is no necessity for creating an explanation of your educational influence in your own learning and the learning of others. And that is where you move on from the action reflection cycle into living educational theory research but I found that action reflection cycle very, very helpful indeed. Now, the cycle is one of the distinguishing characteristics of action research. And I think you would need to go through that to actually claim that you're actually going through action research. Even when um, the, the people beginning this in, 19, in the 1940s, that was a distinguishing feature of the action research. The first book on action research to improve school practice in 1953 by Stephen Corey used that action reflection cycle. But there are many methods and methodologies that you can use. I love autoethnography, for example, where the individual studies their own practice but highlights the importance of the cultural influences. I love the self study movement of the American Education Research Association because it requires you to study your own practice and your own self. But for the actual reflection cycle, I do think you have to go through those phases to actually distinguish what it is you're doing as actual research. You've got to explain your practice to distinguish it as living educational theory research. But that's a great question, Mohammed. Many thanks indeed. So do keep the questions coming. Uh, as I say, I found this very, very helpful indeed. Now, my last point that I just want to highlight for you um, goes back to from publishing. I just want to show you this, um, that sometimes uh, people are asked about the legitimacy of this approach. Um, you know, I'm, I'm asked, um, well, aren't these just anecdotes? Aren't these just subjective accounts of an individual in their practice? Now, what I came to the University of Bath to do in 1973 was to demonstrate that individual practitioners like you and I could get the highest academic award for researching our own practice. And they weren't just anecdotal accounts. They were narratives, but each one contained a rigorous and evidence-based explanation of educational influences in learning. And what I, I want, and I hope you will do, is to access um, the archive of living educational theories, which begin with Ariana Begadi's doctorate. Uh, Ariana had the formal 
uh, award of her degree. She got it in 2020, but the award just took place in November 2021. And this was on my living theory of international development. <coughs> now, John Branch, who a uh, doctorate of professional studies by public works on teaching. And this is why I think it could be very relevant to your scholarships of teaching and learning. And um, teaching is like engineering, my living educational theory. And he got this, although it's from America, he uh, we graduated from Middlesex University in 2020. Now you'll see that um, if you go into all of this collection here of living educational theory doctorates, you'll see they're from universities throughout the world. This one of Elizabeth Campbell's. Now look at the title because I don't know how many of you would say, I love what I do. Now, I hope it's obvious to you that I do love what I do. You know, that I've returned this enthusiasm and belief in the value of what I'm doing. And I hope that the energy I feel communicates to you. Now, this love, to have love as an academic standard of judgment, this has come into several living theory doctrines. And this one of Elizabeth Campbell from the University of Nipissing in Canada, and it's how has love influenced me as a teacher, researcher, and learner. Uh, again, Christine Jones, that's from a, a UK university, Liverpool Hope, my living theory of living inclusive and inclusional empowerment, a living theory research approach. Uh, Anne Kaiser uh, Reimer from uh, Utrecht in the Netherlands in search of cosmopolitanism in higher education. But you'll just see Nelson Mandela University, they've got a really very uh, impressive group of practitioner researchers at Nelson Mandela University and Bruce Derman yesterday uh, organized a gathering and they are really pushing forward with practitioner research and they're well worth connecting at the Nelson Mandela University. Uh, Professor Leslie Wood used to be at Nelson Mandela, now moved up to Northwestern University and again, Leslie Wood has been very influential in South Africa in developing practitioner research, action research within that context. So do, I hope you will all recognize these names and hopefully make contact with them. Um, you've got uh, Sa Sajarin, again, this was lovely, about transformative teacher educating in Pakistan uh, from the University of Kathmandu in Nepal. University of Malaya. Michael Dents, Helen Connor, Elizabeth Woolborg, University of Pretoria in South Africa. I don't want to go on for too long because I'm coming to an end of my talk, but I do hope that this will give you the confidence that this approach is now recognized literally throughout the world in terms of being both academically legitimate, but it is also having a really powerful um, international influence, which you could contribute to in terms of your own uh, practice, but in particular through your scholarship of teaching and learning as you work together cooperatively to enhance. And again, it's the work going on associated with the University of Malaysia to actually enhance the educational influence you're having through your scholarship of teaching and learning with both your students, but also with your, your cultural influences. Now, I hope um, I'll just actually go back to the um, last question now, which just two minutes. It says, when we have a common concern um, for the sake of students, but we fail to agree on a way forward, each holding to our own ideas. So what is your view about how to move forward uh, for the students' sake? Now, my view is what I'm doing now at the University of Cambria with staff. If you just keep contact with me, um, I've submitted for 10 of our staff to actually create a symposium for the British Education Research Association, where we have all agreed to actually research our own questions of the kind, how do I improve my practice? And it's with living values of human flourishing. So we might all have different values, we might all have different contexts, but we've all come together to say, look, we're willing to work cooperatively to actually help each other to inquire into improving our own practice. And for our students' sake, to help them to enhance their own learning. Um, that is that one. And I hope, Sarah, Mather, you know, we can just retain a contact together so we can develop this work together. Now, it, um, it says we're from, uh, is this uh, Fazia? Researching your own practice may not be comfortable, but some having to step back and reflect practice and how it has influenced others. What advice would you give to novices 
embarked into doing actual research and researching their own living theory. Well, this is why with a novice, I would say, look, get together with colleagues, uh, groups of you, you know, about eight people, they found really important mutual support groups. I've got quite a number of these all around the world, and I could actually help, I think, you to form and sustain your own group. Fill in your action planner together, share it. Let each person know what your concerns are on your values, what you are faced with the issues on a day-to-day -day basis that you're trying to improve. This is by far the best way for novice researchers to get going. And you can actually then link in with other people around the world. And as I say, do please sustain your conversation with me and I'll do what I can to help. Okay, I say it's hijacked. Sometimes it's much easier to share findings with the research community at large than our own colleagues in the same department. What is your opinion? Completely agree that you sometimes find that by going to a national conference, for example, in Malaysia, or going to an international one, you know, there's one in South Africa, America, Britain, Nepal, Pakistan, India. There are international conferences and groups that will be interested. Uh, in Pakistan, there's a huge practitioner researcher network that would, I think, love to hear from you. And you could actually participate in their conferences. So yes, absolutely. But when you're finding it isolating in your own institution, do actually connect and um, share your own research so they can find out what you're doing and you can find out what they're doing. Um, that's it. It says, thank you, Jack. That's what UTLC have been doing by the annual Inspiration Scholar Symposium. Exactly that. And it, it really is exciting to see the work you're actually doing. But I'm just encouraging you now to develop, if you like, the rigor of your scholarship of teaching and learning, to share that together, and also then take it into these different international forums so that your university or the University of Malaysia can actually get better known. And in particular, with the values that you're all really passionately concerned about and living as fully as you can. And this is what we can learn globally from you in terms of educational research. Um, it says, if we conduct actual research, do not have colleagues to validate, can the outcome be considered as a living theory? Now, could I just ask, Sarima, um, I've come to the end of my talk and I know we had the question and answer session. Is that all right if I just move into that? Yes, uh, yes, yes. I think we just go ahead with, with more questions coming in, yeah. Okay, so um, that's fine with Sarima with the chat, you know, it's just to open it up now for as many questions as we possibly can manage um, so that we feel that, you know, you've had your interests covered uh, through the session. Um, and that's what it says. Uh, this is from Asaya Abu uh, Akar. If we conduct action research, but did not have a colleague to validate, can the outcome be considered as living theory? Now, again, this is a really important question that <coughs> what I found, and I've done this right from the start of my inquiries, the people initially would criticize what I offered as being merely subjective, merely anecdotal. Now, if you don't go through a validation group, and I went through many, you know, I wouldn't go for longer than four to six weeks without holding a validation group, because you can suffer from data overload. If you don't actually integrate your data within a valid explanation of influence, evidence-based, you tend to get data overload. You've got so much data to make sense of. So you're very wise to produce an account which then forms the data for your next one. Now, this point about can the outcome be considered as living theory? It can be. A living theory is just, it is an explanation and it's evidence-based of your educational influence in learning, in the learning of others, and the learning of the social formation that influences your practice and understanding. So if you do that, that is what a living educational theory is constituted by. It's your evidence-based explanation of your educational influence in your learning, learning of others, and the learning of the social formation. Now, that is your living educational theory. Now, to avoid being open to the criticism of too much bias, or this is anecdotal, it's just subjective, you actually put it into a validation group 
and you strengthen the validity and rigor through what is called intersubjective testing. This is what the philosopher Karl Popper emphasized. He actually highlighted what he called the mutual rational controls of critical discussion. This is where you can strengthen the rigor and the validity of your explanation of educational inference. So whereas you could call your explanation, your living educational theory, you highlight and strengthen its rigor and validity through subjecting it regularly to validation exercises. And I've gone through the criteria you can use in the paper that is on my website. Is that okay now? Could I just check? Okay. Yeah, that, it, it, this is really important the intersubjective validity, okay? That uh, if we just have our own view and we never check it out with others, you can be um, so, and I was really guilty of this. I, I was not hypocritical, but the inspectors in London in 1971, they asked me, they gave me one of the very first video cameras and recorders to experiment with. I was the head of science in a secondary school. And they asked me to experiment with it in my science department. The first thing I did was turn it on my class, turn it on myself, because I thought I had got inquiry learning going with my students. In inquiry learning, the students are asking their own questions, just as I'm encouraging you to ask your question of the kind, how do I improve what I'm doing? Now, I thought I had got inquiry learning going with my students. I believed it. Now, the video camera showed that what I was actually doing, and I was doing it quite subtly, but I was giving my students the questions to ask. Now, it was a tremendous shock to me because I genuinely believed I was actually uh, encouraging my students to ask their own questions. Now, that was when I first saw myself as a living contradiction. You know, I believed I, these values of inquiry learning. In my own practice, I could see myself denying it. Now that is why it highlighted for me the importance of validation, the importance of taking one's own beliefs and what one believes one is doing to others with evidence. And this is why the video was so important to me to show uh, whether or not I was actually doing what I believed I was doing. Okay, so that is why the digital visual data, as I say, if you can do it on your own practice, I think you will find it invaluable, especially in communicating and clarifying the meanings of your values. This sense of the embodied energy that, the, that you express in your practice <coughs> with your values, you know, you know, this freedom, justice, the ones that your vice chancellor has actually put forward on the homepage of your university's website. Now, uh, the next question is, uh, can the poster route community practice be my means to validate my AR or must I have a critical friend when I am conducting my AR? Now, the posters group, that can certainly act as your validation group or your critical friend, that by actually putting your poster and having a poster group, that you can actually put this to them and they can actually respond. There are groups around the world that you can actually just submit your poster to and your evidence-based explanation, and they will respond to you in these different international communities. So this is why it's really important not to be isolated and not to actually feel that you don't have a, a critical friend. There are people in our living theory research communities all the way around the world that will certainly uh, support you. So never feel that isolated. You will always have, as I say, the groups, and I put those in the living poster group on my website that you can contact, you can actually write to. <coughs> the Neary group is a wonderful one to actually make contact with. Uh, you know, there are ones in Canada, there are South Africa, there are, as I say, the practitioner, the PAR group, the uh, participatory action research group in Pakistan. It really is fantastic, you know, the support they're providing for each other. University of Kathmandu in Nepal, again, a very influential group that have actually got international conferences that go about transformative education. So please don't be isolated. You know, that if you are feeling that, do please contact me. My email is on uh, the web page at the bottom, and I can certainly put you in touch with the people that would actually really be interested in. Yeah. Now, again, I've got recognizing living contradiction isn't a bad thing, is it? No, I, do you know, it was one of the most stimulating 
and creative experiences, literally, of my research life. Um, so I've never actually thought of being a living contradiction being a bad thing. It actually stimulated my imagination to improve my practice. You know, I embrace that I as a living contradiction. You're not being hypocritical. It's actually, you're shown that things that you feel you could improve, you're living and practicing in a way that you can then see that you could improve it. So definitely being a living contradiction was certainly one of the most stimulating and continues to be one of the most motivating and stimulating experiences in my professional life. So I've never ever viewed it as a bad thing. You know, it's actually uh, it, because you passionately hold your values, the recognition that you're not living the values as fully as you can motivates you to improve your practice. So this for me has been the grounding of my living theory research. And it says, do we need many critical friends to validate or one or two would be sufficient? You can certainly, you know, just one other person can help you to improve the validity by having a critical friend that goes through your account and actually helps you to improve its comprehensibility. Look at that issue of the evidence that you're using to justify your claim to knowledge. Look at the cultural influences, the socio-historical influences, which you may not be aware of and your critical friend might be that are influencing your practice that you can demonstrate you're becoming aware of. Like for example, the Malaysian cultural influences will be quite strong. The cultural, the institutional influences, recognize those and then see if they're supportive of your values or actually they do need to be improved. So I would say you, one person can help you, but I found between three to eight people is certainly the optimal number of having a group that can actually go through your um, draft explanations and actually try to help to strengthen them. Okay, so, right. Um, uh, no. Jeff, perhaps, perhaps we have uh, questions from the audience who wish to speak to you directly. Yeah, by all means, do please, sorry, Mark. You know, if you can see them and just bring them in, that would be great. Any question, anyone? Perhaps it's not something that can be expressed in the chat, but can verbally be. Uh, what should I do? I'll stop sharing my screen. Um, yes, I've got, I've got it on gallery. Good. Anyone? Okay, Jack. Uh, I think the fear is always about reflecting and what, uh, uh, where to begin, and you know. So that's a lot of concern that uh, this reflection is making you sounding sad or inadequate. And I think a lot of time in a in a university where the KPIs are research publication. Uh, people seem tend to probably see uh, reflection in teaching as something that is, you know, uh, uh, not not really helping with the KPI. So, what do you think of that? Well, I, I suppose I understand uh, if you say, for example, um, as I started off in nineteen, this was sixty seven. I've got a problem, right? That I was in a, a science classroom and I wasn't communicating with my students at all. It was the very first class I taught. <laughs> in September 1973 or oh, 67. And I went home that night feeling, oh gosh, I've got a problem. I'm not communicating to my students. How do I improve what I'm doing? Now, it wasn't that I, I saw that I was, the, if you like, the problem and I had a, a negative view of myself. It was that I was passionate about scientific understanding. And it was that desire to improve my pupils' understanding that motivated me. So I've never seen it as a problem in that negative sense. I've always thought, oh, how do I improve what I'm doing grounded in the values that I'm passionate about? So it's always been uh, something which I've wanted to ask and never seen it as negative. And, and it's actually been at the heart of my research as well. So my international reputation, uh, I was also president of the British Education Research Association. And it's been built from researching my own practice and taking my explanations of educational influence into those uh, national forums, into the international referee journals, getting published there. So I've never seen it as a, a negative issue to do with 
um, if you like, something which I am the problem. Do, am I making sense here? That I've always seen that sense. That, have you, I often put it as a concern because people said, look, they might be people uh, uh, identified with a concern in the sense that, you know, I've got certain values that I hold rather than defining it as a problem. But I don't have a problem, you know, I don't have any difficulty in acknowledging that sense of a problem. As a scientist, you know, when I got my first degree in science, problems were really fantastic. They, they were central to what we did. You know, it was overcoming the issue of the problem. So, but I understand what you're saying, Sarame. It really is important not to see yourself as the problem in a negative sense. It, it, you show a concern or a problem, but it's from a passionate desire to improve practice with values that will unite us all in terms of those values of human flourishing. Yeah. And this actually actually can just up creativity, doesn't it? Oh, God, it, it, if you see yourself as a living contradiction, it does exactly that. It actually stimulates your imagination. It's beyond, if you're like your conscious control, that it creates that stimulus to your creativity. As soon as you see that you're not living your values as fully as you believe you could do, it stimulates your imagination to think of ways in which you could do. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, anybody uh, who wish to speak to Jack uh, directly? This is yeah. uh, an opportunity. Shouldn't be missed. <laughs> may, may I just ask one last question? Yes. Uh, this is regarding the uh, intervalidation. Um, can you um, show us uh, where is it in the uh, journal or in, in whatever report that we are writing, we have to mention about uh, the methodology or approach that we use for intervalidation. Is it a must where, uh, when we write such a, a journal? For us to discuss about how do we do our intervalidation? Yes, I, what I can do, uh, um, if uh, what I could do with Sarma is I can put the reference. The, one of the best examples was from uh, a Chinese student of mine called uh, Peggy Leong, and she applied. In fact, it was called Winter Six Criteria for Enhancing Rigor, which is part of the validation process. And it's a superb illustration of how these six principles are uh, to enhance the rigor of an action research study were carried out. You know, it's a really elegant study. Now, I've got that on the web and I can actually send you the URL. Yes. Uh, you know, yes. I'll do that. Okay. But it, that's a really important question. And this idea of the validation, it comes into all of the doctorates on the website. You'll see that they've all at some time explained how they have actually subjected their explanations, their evidence-based explanations to validation groups and strengthened the validity of their explanations. So again, a really important question. Thank you, that's great. Okay. Any more from the audience? We still have time. Okay. Um, um, well, I guess uh, there's no more, uh, but I'm sure um, we are very captivated by, uh, you know, all this talk about um, living educational theory. It's something that, uh, I mean, in, in Malaysia, I think this is not uh, widely um, realized that uh, of its ex existence. So I hope this will be, you know, because a lot of time when we do research, we're thinking in terms of how do I make sure that my study is accepted by, you know, uh, through the conventional way of doing research? Uh, when um, so, so this is an opportunity actually um, to to create our own sense of living theory in about our own practices which work for our own students. Am I right? Absolutely. You know that when you think that I have this. Um... Um, if you like, object into my research in 19, this was 1973-74. Uh, you know, people didn't believe you could put I in a research question. You know, how do I improve my practice? Um, now, that is becoming common. You can go into almost any university in the UK and elsewhere where that kind of question is now accepted. How, how do I improve my practice? Um, it, it took me several years 
to demonstrate that practitioners like ourselves could get their doctorates from actually examining our own practice and in particular with our values, that our values became new standards of judgment, new explanatory principles. You know, they weren't just value words like in the homepage of the university, that these were embodied expressions of meaning. So I hope you can feel as I've been addressing you today, that there is an energy there that I would have to bring into my explanation of any educational influence that I was having. I do have a passion for freedom and justice, which it's only through this embodied expression of meaning that you could understand the meaning of those values. You could bring those as new legitimate academic standards of judgment into the universities in Malaysia. I hope I'm making sense here because all of those living theory doctorates, um, you know, now there are over 50 of them from universities all around the world that have been legitimated without my influence. <laughs> you know, because they've taken the ideas and those universities have now accepted, like you could in Malaysia, you could demonstrate how the present explanatory principles that are used in educational research really aren't getting as close as they could do to the understanding of the values that you're living in your everyday practice. And you could show these through modern technology, digital visual data, including this within your explanations of influence. You know, it really is the most exciting time to be living in at the moment. And in uh, Malaysia, you have got amazing contributions that could now be made. So that's absolutely right, yes. It's true. So there are means and ways to actually uh, validate our work. Um, there's no one particular way to do it, but so so we have to brave ourselves, I guess, to to actually explore uh, it meaningfully. Yeah. It In this room at the moment, you know, honestly, when you look at the whole gallery, I, the critical capacity that is in this room is literally it's of such global significance. You could actually highlight your own critical discourse. Am I, do I make sense when I talk about intersubjective testing? <coughs> you could form for each other the most critical group to highlight the rigor and the validity of your contributions to educational knowledge. And it's in this room at the moment that the University of Malaysia brought together in the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning a most amazing um, if you like, rigorous and critical group of researchers. And you could use this as the base, as I think you could do, to enhance the quality of educational research, not only within Malaysia, but actually globally. And it starts with your own practice, from within your educational influence in your own practice and researching it. And that's why it's such a pleasure and an honor to actually be asked to today to come to actually talk with you. <laughs> so many, many thanks indeed for that invitation. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's our pleasure to have you here, uh, Jack. It's, it's a big opportunity for us. And I hope we will be able to uh, collaborate. You know, uh, I'm, there are those who wrote to me saying they hope that they will be able to converse with you and, you know, uh, share their ideas. So I guess through the poster sharing, yeah. that will be one way to, to do it. So if there's no more question from the audience, I, 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 I would like to thank everyone for joining this session today. And I especially would like to thank you, Jack, for you know, waking up early in the morning to, <laughs> to be with us today. And uh, yes, um, uh, um, we hope to, and, and um, my, our uh, director of uh, the unit, uh, University Teaching and Learning sends his regards to you. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, and this um, Dr. Fauzi, I think, th is expressing thanks to you for sharing your ideas and experiences. Very helpful and much appreciated. Yes, we thank you so much, Jack. Uh, and uh, we hope to, to perhaps uh, listen to you again in the future. Well, I do hope so. I would love, you know, just to keep the contact going and to learn more about your research. And I do hope you all feel that desire to produce your own living poster and share it. You know, this will keep our conversation going. So yeah. many, many thanks in this. <laughs> That's you. really Thank you so much. And very much. See you yeah. soon and take care. Stay safe. Yes. Thank keep you very on. much. Thank okay. you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Okay.